morning everyone and welcome to today's service. Paula Beelbe is going to be preaching and his, his theme is Christ is the living bread that gives eternal life. Last week he spoke about us being a royal priesthood. We are God's own possession. But with that comes the responsibility and we must allow God's light to shine in and through us so we can draw others to him. Uh, those who are serving, Susan has done the video editing, Andrew's going to be leading the worship, and Lauren's going to do the reading. And we must bear in mind that a lot of work goes into this. And I just want to thank everyone for stepping up to the plate and allowing the service to run as smoothly as it does and keep the wheels turning. And now, we'll open in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the service this morning. We thank you that although we are part, we can still meet together and worship you. And so we just commit the service to you and we pray your blessing on us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Right, we're going to have a hand over to the worship team. Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even 
when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work. Promise me, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way As I left my hands to pray I got every reason to be here again A Father's love that draws me in And all my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you And all I need is you
time on earth is done, louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only sing your praise. Morning, church. This morning's verse comes from John 6, verse 51 to 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves, How can this man give us this, his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I greet you once more in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us become silent in the presence of the Lord this morning. Eternal God, we praise you for your word, which is light to us in our darkness. Help us both to hear and to believe the promises you have spoken. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, this morning we journey under the theme, Christ is the living bread that gives life. The living bread that gives eternal life. Jesus is teaching at a synagogue in Capernaum during a preparation for the Jewish festival of Passover when the people remember their exodus from Egypt. A time where people go back in time and remember their liberation from slavery. The passage that we have read, John chapter 6, verse 51 to 58, is a continuation of a lesson that begins in verse number 22 of chapter 6, with the theme of Christ as the bread that gives life, the bread that came down from heaven. A lesson which follows after the miracle of multiplication or the miracle of the feeding, the feeding of the 5,000. And from that miracle, we see that a lot of people, crowds followed Jesus. And at his following, listen to the response of Jesus. He outrightly calls them out that they are doing this, not so much because of what he is saying, not so much because of the miraculous signs they have seen, especially the miracle of the feeding itself, but they were following him because they ate bread and they wanted more. That is what Jesus is saying in responding to them coming to him or to their following. He's saying, your following is conditional. You are following because you are in need of more bread, bread as you had eaten the previous day. He informs them that what they are looking for is, a, is little compared to what he actually is offering them. He's saying what you are looking for is less than what I can actually offer you. The bread they need will keep them coming for more. The bread they need will keep them, after eating they will become hungry and they will be tempted or forced actually to go out seeking for more as they had done in this meeting that he had with them. And he says to them, I have bread. I have bread that will, to, that will satisfy you. Bread that will satisfy them for eternity. And they ask, 
when they hear him saying this. He says to them, you are looking for bread, you are, you are looking, seeking after things that perishes, but the bread that I have want to eat it, you will never hunger again. And they cry out with a loud voice, please, Lord, give us this bread. Give us this bread, they ask. Can we listen closely, brothers and sisters? From verses 22, Jesus goes back and forth as he tries to present his lesson or this teaching that he is bringing to these people. Why is he doing this? He is doing this in order for him to, 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 to imprint in these people's minds upon their hearts this message of life as we have already established that the gospel of John was written in order to present a Christ who is not so who is not so much interested with the conditional or the ethical living of the people but rather a Christ who is saying to the people abide in me and have life a Christ who is saying to the people be connected with me for I am the source of what life is it is not so much about do this and do not do that but it is about be united with me have life in me or with me. This is what the gospel is about. And Jesus goes forth and backwards as he is trying to emphasize this teaching to this group of people. But we have to observe what is happening. The lesson that Jesus is giving makes his listeners draw closer to him. But the following day or in the next paragraph as he continues to teach, they withdraw. It is There is a movement of going back and forth. The people as well are withdrawing as they they come closer at the same time. At the feeding of the 5,000, there is something that we have to see. The crowds are pulled in. The crowds are made to recall what God promised them in the wilderness in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, that he will raise from among them a prophet. That is the promise that God gave to them at the time when Moses was going out. God says to this group of people, I will raise for you a prophet. I will raise for you a prophet from among you. The new Moses. At the feeding, they saw the new Moses. At the feeding, they saw him as he blessed the little bread that was there, as he blessed the little fish that was there. They really saw Moses. They remembered what God that did for, for them through the hand of Moses in the wilderness. And they exclaimed with hope. They exclaimed, brothers and sisters, filled with hope. This is truly the prophet who is coming into the world. And we hear in that passage that they wanted at that moment to make him king, to inaugurate him, to lift him up. And Jesus disappeared. The passage that we have read from the onset, Jesus introduces himself as the bread that came down from heaven. The bread that gives eternal life to its consumers. And if that was not enough, he further reveals to this group of people, that is what Jesus is doing, he further reveals to his listeners that his flesh is that bread. The bread which will give, will be given for the life of the world. Reiterating what was stated in John chapter 1 verse 14, that the Word became flesh and the Word dwelt among us. Yes, full of glory, full of truth, we have seen Him. Now that flesh, brothers and sisters, must be consumed, must be eaten. Now here we have to understand that the, the dynamics or the controversy that is around this insinuation or this teaching that Jesus is giving to these people, that his flesh has to be eaten. We have to understand the confusion or the commotion that happens after he presents this gospel to them to say, my body is that flesh, is that bread that you must eat. I am the bread that you must eat. That was uncalled for. It was forbidden by the law of Moses to drink blood or to even eat, eat, eat flesh, as recorded in Leviticus chapter number 17. The dispute of the Jewish people is justified. 
It is a justified response considering the nonsensical insinuation by Jesus that they should eat his flesh, not only eat his flesh. As Jesus, you chooses a very offensive version of the way to eat. The Greeks said a way of saying it, but Jesus chooses a very offensive way of the way to eat. A more graphic way, a more desperate way of doing it, of people who are really hungry, people who are desperately and desperately in need of satisfaction. Seems like Jesus is saying to them, you desperately need to die on my flesh for you to have life and have it in abundance. He, you have to understand and see what Jesus is doing in this. He is not only promising them life now. He is not only promising them satisfaction now. He is saying you will have eternal life and this eternal life only you will have when you die on my flesh. For my flesh is real bread. Verses 54, 56, and 57, and 58, the word for eating there as used is an ag aggressive one of chewing or munching, not so much a polite way of, of, of going about it, an earthy way of going about it, but a more aggressive uh, uh, way of eating. And Jesus is saying to these people, you need to eat my flesh for you to have life. You need to dine on me. I wonder whether in their minds what came was, is this cannibalism that this man is introducing to us? What the hell is he talking about that we should dine on his body? What exactly is this person talking about? How can we? When they heard him telling them that he was the bread of life, the bread that was better than the manna, their forefathers ate in the wilderness, the bread that their forefathers were sustained with, in the wilderness. The bread that was a channel for them to have life in the wilderness. Jesus is saying that bread was nothing compared to the bread that my body is. He provided a chance for life to the people of God in the wilderness. He provided a chance for them. But Jesus is saying, no, though they ate that manna one thing happened after eating, they continued to die. But the bread that I am bringing to you, the offer that I am giving you this morning, that I am giving you this day, is that when you dine on this bread, when you dine on me as the bread that gives life, brothers and sisters, you will never see death. You will live and continue to live. Anyone who needs to live to have eternal life must eat my flesh and drink my blood. For well, I am the manna that is life giving. That is what Jesus says to this group of people. And the Jewish people, when they heard that, there was a dispute among themselves. A very hard pill to swallow if we have to come down to it, brothers and sisters. If we were sitting in that room with all those people, maybe we could have had a little bit of an understanding of where the commotion and the dispute is coming from. Because they are looking at him and they are listening to him and he is saying to them, I am the bread that gives life and if you have to have life, you must eat my flesh, you must drink my blood. And they are looking at him as he's standing before them and they are saying, what is this man speaking about? This is abomination. Leviticus does not allow us even to drink blood of animals. What more of a human being? What more eating the flesh of a human being? This might have been going through their heads. The text does not necessarily give us the, 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 whole, the whole discussion or dispute itself. But the fact that they dispute among themselves. How can he give us his own flesh? How can he give us his own flesh and his own blood for us to drink? What, what is he talking about? When you go and read in verse number, from, from verse number 60 of the very same chapter going to 69, you will hear that when the disciples, some of the disciples of Jesus had, had this, 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 you know, this presentation, they said, they exclaimed and spoke out, this is a hard teaching. Who can believe it? Who can accept it? You know, 
how can I accept it? And we see what happens from there that they start moving away. My brothers and sisters, in this instance, as they're disputing, instead of Jesus giving them clarity on what he meant, he does not do that. He continues to emphasize his teaching that apart from him, apart from dining on his flesh and drinking his blood, they will never see life. There is no life if they do not dine on him. No life at all. But those who dine on him will be raised from the dead. Those who dine on him will be given life eternal. They will be given life today and they will be given life even, even if they die. They will be given life through and through. It's, it's brothers and sisters of a living hope for those who have a share in him, for those who have communion with him. This is exactly, brothers and sisters, what the whole chapter, chapter number six, is about. It is not, it is, if not the whole of the gospel of John, that people may come and have a share in Christ, that they may come and have fellowship with him, that they can come and have union with this Christ who calls them to life. This is what Jesus is saying. When you listen very clearly to the Gospel of John, when you listen very clearly to the passage that we have read, when you listen to the whole of chapter 6, you are able to hear Jesus who is saying to this community of people, come to me and have life, and have life in abundance. Come to me, be united with me. You know, earlier on he was calling them to come to him, but this time around he has up the scale. It is no longer about a matter of coming, but it's a matter of actually participating in partaking of his flesh and drinking of his blood. He calls them into close proximity. He calls them into intimacy with him. Chapter 6 is the call for us to have communion with the Lord. Especially the passage that we have read. Brian Peterson, a professor of New Testament at the Lutheran Seminary, Theological Seminary in Columbia, he states that chapter 6 brings to mind the Eucharist. However, he states that it is not primarily about the Eucharist. Where the people of God come together to dine on the body of Christ, to be made into, to be, to be, to be united with this Christ. But he says it is, it is mostly about Jesus Himself, who is the food that came down from heaven, the food that came down from the Father, and He is presenting Himself in front of everybody at that table, and He's saying, "Come and have a share of Me and have life in abundance." As I have already stated earlier, that all these are happening as the Jewish people are looking forward to the feast of Passover in a few days, their redemption. A festival which reminded God's people of that great deliverance, the deliverance they have experienced from the mighty hand of the Lord, the deliverance that ushered them out of Egypt into their promised land, Canaan, the deliverance that made them who were not a people, a people, the deliverance that made them who had not received mercy, brothers and sisters, to be the people of God. The people of God. A place of abundance in life. Today, what Christ is delivering to us or to this group of people as we hear who we are following him takes us to join this motive of writing this gospel that they may believe and have life in him. But much more that they may be one with him. That they may be in union with Christ. Jesus puts the benefits of that union out there for them to see, out there for them to see that they may participate in the fellowship he invites them into. The fellowship he invites each and every one of us into brothers and sisters. There is eternal life for those who are in union with Christ. There is a resurrection for those who are in union with Christ. 
but much more brothers and sisters, those who are in union with Christ, they have a place in him and he has a place in, the, in them. What Jesus is saying to us even this morning is that apart from me, you have no life at all. I am the life-giving bread. Beloved, today, when we may be feeling the coldest and most vulnerable, standing in a position of disadvantage, in need of the warmth of his presence, yes, the warmth that nobody else can give us, the warmth that only God can offer us, the warmth that Jesus Christ invites us this morning to enter into, to come close into a relationship with him, to live being guided by him on a daily basis, brothers and sisters. Christ, through this gospel, invites us into this embrace, into the arena full of life. He brings us back to the land of the living with his own. I am the living bread that gives life to the world. My dear brothers and sisters, Christ is our hope. Not only hope, but our living hope. Let us hold on to him. Let us speak like Paul who speaks in Philippians chapter number 3. I want to know Christ. I want to be intertwined with him. I want to be in this intimacy with him. To share the breath that he breathes. To share the life that he gives. To experience if it means the sufferings that he has, he, he, he had to experience. Not only to share in the resurrection, brothers and sisters, but to share in the, in the death that he had to die, to share in the resurrection and the life that he had to enjoy, or that he enjoys, or he gives to all of us. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the intimacy, this gospel, this morning calls us into. Christ is the living bread that gives life to all, gives eternal life. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us pray. Bread of life, we invite us into communion with you. Grant eternal Lord that we may embrace this gift of belonging and live our lives with the joy of knowing that we are at home in you. Thank you for giving yourself for us. Help us, O oh Lord, to turn to you as we find ourselves at the periphery of life. Our lives have been lost zest and meaning. When we find ourselves in places of uncertainty and despair, may the warmth of your presence resuscitate us from our death and usher us into the abundance of life. For you alone are our hope. You are our truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, blessed forever, we pray. Amen.
you're going to be away for your sermon. And we pray that it will touch our hearts. Now we're going to have the offertory. And before I pray, I just want to encourage you to present your offerings. You can either keep it at home and then when we reopen church, you can bring it with you. You can drop it off at the office or you can pay per EFT. And the, note, the bank details are on the screen now. Right, let us give thanks. Oh Lord, we just thank you that even though in this diffi these difficult times that you are with us and you provide us. And so we offer uh, offerings to you and we pray that you will bless them to the church. We thank you for those who are in charge of administering this and we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Um, right, now we're going to do the prayers of intercession. And there are many people who have been battling, uh, people we know, uh, people who are battling financially or stressed in some other way. And we just pray for those people. And we think particularly of those who are not well. And we've been praying for John Coit for a few weeks now, and he is slowly recovering from COVID. So we give thanks for that. We pray for Peggy Key, who's Mer Vivian Meredith's mom who had a stroke. Heather Chapman, who's still on dialysis. And we think of those who are battling with cancer. There's Ernest von Skulkpeg, Val Silifant, Kevin Demmer, and Renee LaRue. We pray too for Bert and Thea Arl, who Bert, um, Thea is really struggling because Bert is Alzheimer's, is in the advanced stages. So pray for all these people. And we think it's, uh, particularly in uh, Tommy Williams, who's going to be undergoing surgery next week because he's got blocked arteries in his neck and he needs to have stents put in. So just remember these people and those particularly who don't come forward and ask for prayer. So let us pray. Oh Lord, we just thank you that we are able to come to you and bring these people before you and others who are on our hearts. And we know, Lord, that you are the great healer. You know every one of us. You know what's going on inside people's bodies and the good and the bad and we just ask for your healing and your blessing and your peace on these people and we pray this in Jesus name right we're going to hand over to the next team
again. Um, notices, there's only one notice this week and Mancom are going to be meeting on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Birthdays, we've got lots of birthdays this week. Uh, their names are going to be on the screen and we just ask for blessings on these people as they celebrate their birthdays. And for some people it's difficult, but we give them over. But we've come to the end of the service and... As words of encouragement, I just want us to remember that doesn't matter how difficult it is, we can still cope. Um, I think of the weather, people overseas, they're battling with floods and uh, volcanoes, we don't have volcanoes, we don't have tsunamis, we don't have earthquakes. In fact, we've got the best weather in the world. And we think of London, where um, there's a, a joke that asks whether what's the difference between summer in winter in London, the summer, the rain is warmer in summer. And we think too of the Olympics. We, um, you know, some countries have got 50 or so gold medals. We got one. And the whole country was brought together to celebrate that. We think too of the rugby that we beat the British and Irish Lions. And another thing I want to mention is that when I'm driving along the car, as many other people are, We've got potholes that we complain about. But that means we're in a car. That means we're driving, we've got petrol in the tank, we've got money to put petrol in the tank. So we think of people who are not as well off as we are. And there's a few words of encouragement. One was from Martin Luther King. We must accept finite disappointment. We must never lose infinite hope. Henry Ford said, when everything seems to be going against you, Remember that the aeroplane takes off against the wind and not with it. And the last one was President Roosevelt who said, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. And I hope these verses encourage you this week. Let's have the benediction. And the benediction is may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forever. Amen. Thank you.